worship. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and around me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest here in the dark of rocks and trees. Of Thank you. 
is convenient. Would you stand, please? Let's pray together. <clears throat> Dear merciful God, we have come here this morning to honor you with the way that we sing, the way that we talk, the way that we encourage, the way that we love, the way that we remember what has been done for us. We are one heart and one mind. But Father, we have different minds and different hearts in the way that we have had to live in this last week. The winds have indeed blown, and it's been unsettling. And so we ask for peace and comfort. We ask for eyes that see the future and have assurance of the things that we hope for. We're here gathered in the name of your Son and to remember what has been done on our behalf. And we are so grateful that your presence fills this place this morning. We look forward to hearing more of the good news about Jesus, more of the confidence that we have in spite of blowing winds, in spite of unsettling times, that our trust is in you. We're here to rejoice also. There are those among us who have great expectations, deservedly so, of plans, of accomplishments that are all given to you so that you might receive the glory. And so help us to celebrate with one another. Help us to comfort one another as we go through this life. Thank you for bringing us together this morning. All praise and glory are given to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we say, Amen. You may be seated. <laughs>
first job that Matt had out of college was the youth and family minister at Crosstown Church. He and I talked a lot, but we were talking one day, <clears throat> and it was during one of the uh, youth trips that he was getting together for uh, youth uh, things that he was getting together, and they were going out, as I remember it. And he told me that he had so many boots on the ground. And I thought, that is just extremely appropriate. Boots on the ground, as you know, is a military term. And it says I've got so many 500 boots on the ground, which means I got uh, 500 battle-ready soldiers on the ground. But brothers and sisters, I submit to you today that they, I'm looking at a room full of boots on the ground. Obviously not in our military, but in our Lord's military. And I want you to think about this as we go through the communion thoughts this morning. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with the communion? It has everything to do with it because the power and life-giving force comes from Jesus. I want to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. A very familiar passage, and it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Life-giving force that comes through Jesus comes through his death. No dispute. No question. Like I said last week, I always look for inspiration during this particular time, and I quite simply just open the song book. Each song is a lesson in itself, and there's one that sticks out on this, the second day after we celebrated Veterans Day. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Let's pray. Holy Lord, again, we thank you. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for this life that comes through your Son. And as we celebrate this supreme sacrifice, we pray that you would be with us as we partake. We pray that you would be with us as we think about these things, think, think about these emblems that represent our dear Savior's flesh and his blood. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we live this life and that you give us strength always. Father, as we partake now, be with us as we commune together with us truly in your Son's holy name. Amen. Again, my Lord, we come to you, uh, approach your throne with thankfulness and humility. And Father, we just thank you for this next emblem, which represents the life force of our dear Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for this emblem. And again, we thank you for the supreme sacrifice that was given on our behalf. We truly pray for this in your son's name. Amen.
things that I think is just so interesting, and it's always <clears throat> gotten under my skin a little bit, is how we, well, no, the, the marketing people have decided that since Halloween and Christmas are the two most lucrative days, or two most lucrative times during the year, they put out Halloween and Christmas at the same time. And if you ever walked into Lowe's or Home Depot, you're just inundated with Halloween stuff over here and all the scary stuff and the screens and everything. And then on this side, they're playing Christmas music and they have the beautiful lights and it just, it just clashes. However, we're in the midst of the holiday season and you're going to be inundated just like I am about giving to organizations that you knew and never knew existed before. But the work of the church still stays, and the work of the church here is still constant. Again, I, I want to point your attention to the back bulletin board. There's still a lot of uh, things on the bulletin board. If you're looking for something to do this holiday, that's the way to give back because these people have identified, been identified as needing, and that's one thing that we can do because we are so blessed. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you, but this time we thank you for the blessings that you've allowed us to have in this life. Um, we thank you so much for the spiritual blessings that are ours to enjoy and the celebration that we just came through. Uh, Father, we thank you for um, the material blessings. Uh, we thank you for the blessing of health. Um, even though we're in various stages of disrepair all the time, and Father, we just thank you for loving us the way that you do. Father, we pray that you would have, uh, help us to act in a way that's pleasing to you, that we know who we represent, and that you would help us to act and conduct ourselves accordingly. For it's truly in your Son's name. Amen. Today's scripture is from Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Standing, if you're visiting, you have children in between the age of two and fifth grade, just follow the crowd downstairs for children's church. As we prepare to sing this song, it's an old song, but uh, something Michael and whoever uh, is up here always trying to get us to be evangelistic with our, not in a necessarily public way, but with our neighbor or just some way share the good news of Jesus with those around us. Those who sometimes we, unfortunately, I'm speaking for myself, don't sometimes seem worthy. We look in the mirror and we look at somebody else who doesn't really seem worthy. So we need to be sharing the love of Jesus. I love to tell the story of a things above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story 
This morning we're going to be in Ezekiel 33, and we don't do a lot of lessons from the prophets, but here in Ezekiel 33, I think there's a lot of stuff that is applicable to us today. It serves as a warning for our role as Christians. I think there's a lot of crossover between what God is telling Ezekiel and what Christ is telling us in the New Testament. The Old Testament prophets are compared to watchmen. A watchman is someone who is designated to stand watch for a city. And they would go up on top of the city walls, find the very best vantage point that they could, and then just watch for any signs of trouble coming. If an enemy was going to attack them, they wanted to be able to see them coming from as far away as they could so they could warn the city and give them as much time as possible to get ready and to mount a defense. The prophet is like the people's spiritual watchman. God would give a warning to the prophet. There is destruction coming. There is a problem coming. You're, you're getting ready to be wiped out. You're getting ready to go into exile. You know, bad things are on the way. You've been sinning. You've been doing something wrong. So destruction is now coming. So the prophet then goes and he tells the people, he says, destruction's coming, so you need to get ready right now so that you can avert it while you still can. It's not here yet. So you have an opportunity to stop it from happening. So God explains all of this in the first six verses of this chapter. Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Speak to your people and say to them, If I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from among them, and make him their watchman. And if he sees the sword coming upon the land, and blows the trumpet, and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, and did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. There is a partnership between the watchman and the people. If the watchman gives the warning, says it's coming, and the people ignore it, that's their own fault, right? 
The watchman sees an army coming. He blows the trumpet. He says, get ready. It's on its way. It's on the horizon. War is coming. And the people do nothing. They say, oh, it's fine. We'll be all right. They go about their business. They don't do anything. Well, the army gets there, kills them all. Whose fault is it? It's the people's fault. They didn't heed the warning. They had everything they needed, but they didn't listen. But if the watchman sees it coming and just does nothing, he doesn't blow the trumpet, he doesn't warn the people, he just lets it happen, well, now whose fault is it? People are still going to die. Destru the destruction is still coming. But it's the watchman's fault. He didn't do his job. And the blood of those people is on his hands. And so after he says this, he then makes the comparison to the prophet, specifically Ezekiel himself, verses 7 through 9. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity, but you will have delivered your soul. God says, I am putting it on you to warn the people. I am giving you a job to do, and if you don't do it, their blood is on your hands. Now he also says, if you do your job and you warn the people and they just don't listen, well now that's on them. They had the opportunity to repent. They had the opportunity to change their ways. They had plenty of warning. They just ignored it all. So your hands are clean. You've done all that you can do. And this makes sense, right? You cannot make a person change their ways. You can warn them. You can plead with them. You can do everything in your power. To try to help them see the light. You can do whatever you can to help them get their act together. But in the end, if they don't actually want to, they're not willing to put in the effort and do the work, change. You can't make them. God is telling Ezekiel, do everything you can to warn the people. Do everything you can to show them what is going to happen. Try to help them realize the error of their ways. But if they won't listen to you, that's their problem. However, don't get so frustrated with them and angry at them and just decide, you know what, they deserve destruction. They're not listening. They deserve it, so I'm not even going to tell them. I know what's coming, and I'm not going to warn them. I'll just let it happen. Well, if you do that, now you are the one to blame. And you are at fault. Verses 10 and 11. And you, son of man, Say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we rot away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? The warning is just that. It is a warning. There's still time. In verse 10, Israel is saying, Our transgressions and our sins are upon us. We rot away because of them. How can we live? It's hopeless. We've messed up. We deserve destruction, and now destruction is coming. We are doomed. Verse 11, God is saying, no, that's not the case. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I'm not sending destruction because I want you to be destroyed. I want you to turn from your way and live. I'm giving you this opportunity. It is not hopeless. And then we come to verses 12 through 16. And we'll read through this slowly because it does get a little bit wordy right here. And you, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him when he transgresses. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall by it 
when he turns from his wickedness, and the righteous shall not be able to live by his righteousness when he sins. Though I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, yet if he trusts in his righteousness and does injustice, none of his righteous deeds shall be remembered. But in his injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, though I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has taken by robbery, and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right, he shall surely live. The problem for the prophet is people's attitude. Some people are going to hear that warning. Destruction is coming. And they're going to say, you know what? Destruction isn't coming for me. I hear what you're saying. It's coming, but it's not coming for me because I'm a good person. I'm a righteous person. If I weigh my life in the balance, I'm like 75% good. 80% good, 90% good. I'm a pretty good person. That destruction is for wicked people. I don't need to do anything. God is saying it doesn't matter if you are 99% good. If you have sinned, if you have done something, anything bad, and now there's a warning, you better pay real close attention to that warning. Don't trust in your own righteousness. There's a warning for a reason. And on the other hand, there are some people who are saying, yep, I'm definitely going to be destroyed. I'm a wicked person. I'm a bad person. I deserve it. And there's nothing I can do about it. And again, God is saying, no, no, not the case. It doesn't matter if you are 99% bad. The warning is there for a reason. There's still time. The destruction isn't inevitable. You can still do something about it. And the problem for the prophet is that people become entrenched in their views. So the warning doesn't result in any change. Either I'm good and I don't have to do anything, or I'm bad, and there's nothing I can do. They either think it doesn't apply to them, or it is inevitable, so there's no need to do anything. And I think today, people kind of have the same attitude. Ask the average person on the street, do you think you're going to heaven or hell? Why or why not? And you're going to get one of two answers. Either I'm going to heaven because I'm a good person and God doesn't send good people to hell. Or I'm going to hell because I've done too much bad. I've gone too far. My life is such a mess. It is such a wreck. There's no way someone like me can go to heaven. And the warning from God is both of those answers are wrong. Just because you're a good person, however you define good, doesn't mean heaven is inevitable. And you're definitely going there. And just because you're a bad person and you've done terrible things, doesn't mean hell is inevitable and you're definitely going there. We come to verses 17 through 20. Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just, when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. And when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge each of you according to his ways. People say the way of the Lord is not just. It is not fair. It's just not fair. How can a person who's 90% good be destroyed 
Well, a person who's 90% bad finds salvation. That's not fair. That doesn't seem right. God said earlier, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He's not trying to destroy people. He's trying to get them to turn. And Jesus actually tells a parable about this very thing, about it's not fair. We go over to Matthew 20, verses 1 through 15. <clears throat> For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, and to them he said, You go into the vineyard too. Whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last, up to the first. And when those hired, about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. And when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? The message throughout the Old and the New Testament is that God is looking for repentance. He's looking for a humble and contrite heart. He's not looking for people who are at least 51% good. Because the fact is, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. He's not looking for those people who grew up in the church, and I've been 90% good for all of my life, and I went to Bible school, and it's not fair that that other person, he didn't do anything his entire life, he came to Christ later in life. It doesn't matter. He's looking for humble people. Contrite hearts. What he wants is people who can simply admit that fact. That I have sinned. I am wrong. People who can heed the warning and say, It does not matter what I have or have not done. It does not matter how good I have been or have not been. I come before you broken willing to do whatever you require of me for as long as you require. First and foremost, we must understand that very thing. It doesn't matter if you grew up in the church and you know your Bible forward and backward and you're here every Sunday for service and you're a pretty good person. The righteousness of the righteous will not deliver him when he transgresses. The only thing that delivers us is Christ. The only thing that delivers us is Christ. It is turning our lives over to Christ and having that humble and contrite heart that says, where you lead, I will follow. What you command, I will do. I know I'm not good. I know I'm not deserving of anything. Weigh my life in the balance. It does not matter. I fail. Christ and Christ alone is what makes up for it. So I will put my trust and my faith in Him. Hopefully, we all know that. Hopefully, everyone here knows that. Hopefully, that is our attitude and that's the sort of people that we are. But if we are, if that attitude describes us and we are the ones who will heed that warning, and we will follow Christ. Well, now we have a job to do. Because now, 
we become the watchmen. We are the ones tasked with warning people about the coming destruction and preaching the good news of Christ and salvation through him. Christ says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It can be frustrating trying to teach others because it often seems like no one's listening. No one is hearing. This is the complaint of the prophet. No one is listening. I'm out there giving the warning. I'm trying to teach him. I'm trying to let him know, and they're just not listening. And today, people have the same attitudes. They have the same outlook on life, just like God tells Ezekiel. The righteousness of the righteous, the wickedness of the wicked, they become entrenched in their views. They've already decided what they're going to believe. And they're not going to change. They're going to hear the warning and ignore the warning. And so it becomes very easy to be cynical and jaded and pessimistic about sharing the gospel because the world just seems to get worse and worse and worse and nobody's listening. But we have to remember that as the watchman, as the one who knows the truth and sees the coming destruction, it is our job to sound the alarm. It is our job to let people know. It is our job to put the gospel out there and say, this is where you find salvation. Because in the end, if the people refuse to listen and they refuse to change, we've done our job. The blame is on them. But what if we just don't sound the alarm? What if we just don't tell people? What if we are the watchmen and we decide, I'm not going to let them know. Who's to blame now? God told Ezekiel, if the watchman doesn't warn the people, those people are going to be destroyed. And their blood is on the hand of the watchman. If we have the good news, we have a responsibility to spread that good news. To tell people, to shout it from the rooftops, to let every single person that we can know. And that's a responsibility we need to take very seriously. We close this morning with an invitation, and it is an invitation to heed the warning. Judgment is coming. And God says in Ezekiel 33, 20, I will judge each of you according to his ways. What are your ways? How will you be judged? If you need to set something right that isn't right, this is your opportunity to heed the warning. If you need to put on Christ in baptism, you can come to the front this morning. We will be happy to help you with that. If you know that you have strayed off the path and you need to be restored, this invitation is for you as well. Whatever your need is, hear the word. Hear the warning. Hear the call. Hear the invitation. And respond to it. Please come while we stand and sing. I heard the voice of Jesus
Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, our, our rock, our everything, Lord, you are the most powerful. You are the most high. We appreciate all of the many things that you do for us every single day. We're humbled to be able to worship freely here in this country, and be able to come into this building of believers and, and learn about all of the many things that you have given to us in your book. Lord, I ask you today that you light this congregation on fire. Give us what we need to build the work here. Give us the encouragement to lift each other up. Give us the strength to help each other when we're down. Give us the love that we need to hold each other and to show each other respect and to build each other up. Help us to encourage each other, Lord. Get all of the devil's discouragement out of our hearts, out of our minds. Let us focus on you. Let us focus on this work. Let us focus on building each other up. Let us focus on you, Lord. Thank you so much for everything that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.